really glad you're here tonight. We've got a terrific program uh, because we have a couple of really smart people here to share their insights with you. Curtis Wilkie and I have had the privilege this semester of teaching some very bright students. Journalism 580, it's called, and it's been a class on Camelot, the Kennedys, and the media. And tonight, uh, we're going to discuss that very topic uh, with two people who have seen politics and public policy from many perspectives. And they have the uh, good fortune of being close friends with Curtis Wilkie. And I have the good fortune of being able to work with Curtis, who is the inaugural fellow of the Overby Center. And so I'm going to let Curtis introduce his good friends, and then we're going to have a conversation. I got to hear this. I hope yeah. you'll join in <laughs> as well. Yeah, and, I, and I have the best fortune because you're all friends of mine, but uh, I want to especially welcome Susan and Tom back to Oxford. They are frequent guests uh, to Oxford and uh, stay with Nancy and me and come down for various things. Sometimes, usually, we don't make them. Uh, now we have to sing for our supper. <laughs> <laughs> Sing for your supper and, and your football tickets. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we're delighted to have you. Just a, a little bit of background. Uh, Tom Oliphant is one of my dearest, oldest friends. We've been running mates for 40 years or more. We worked together at the Boston Globe. And uh, uh, before Tom became a columnist for the Globe, we uh, quite often had... Uh, bylines we called it either the owl team elephant wilkie or the woe team wilkie elephant and uh, we covered a lot of national politics together um, tom is married to susan spencer who has been a member of the cbs news team in washington we won't say how long maybe susan because a while. <laughs> for a while a and while. Uh, tom and susan both have covered the white house uh, they, uh, we've all covered uh, certainly Senator Ted Kennedy and uh, you know new other members of the Kennedy family where uh, I'm probably the only one who was actually a reporter when John Kennedy was president but I never knew John Kennedy and only laid eyes on him twice as a student uh, but one thing I should say that further establishes their bona fides um, um, they uh, basically met and became a number on the 1980 uh, Ted Kennedy campaign for the presidential nomination. And when they later were married, Senator Kennedy was at the lunch at the nice Italian restaurant and people were toasting and Senator Kennedy said, I want to say that this marriage it's probably the best thing that came out of my campaign. Day. <laughs> so we're just delighted to have them. We love having them in Oxford. Whenever we go to Washington, we, we stay with them. They're dear friends. So thank you guys for being with us today. Curtis, Curtis's mention of uh, the Teddy Kennedy's presidential campaign reminds me that there's never been a family like the Kennedys. Uh, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr wanted more than anything else for his son to be president of the United States. And he got that wish. But in addition to that, uh, all three of his sons ran for president. No other family has had three sons run for president of the United States. All three sons were elected to the United States Senate. No other family has ever had three uh, siblings uh, run and win the United States Senate. So I'd start by asking uh, Susan and Tom, uh, because you're good at understanding politics, what is it 50 years later that causes us still to be fascinated with the Kennedys and specifically John Kennedy? You want to start? No, you start. I'll start. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's, it's hard not to think that some of it is just sheer glamour. Uh, there had never been a presidential couple like Jackie Kennedy and John Kennedy. She was 31 years old when he was elected uh, with a small child and another on the way. She could speak French. I mean, she wore designer clothes. You know, she 
uh, knew how to present herself. And you know, she was following Mamie Eisenhower, which may not have been a tough act to follow, but nevertheless, <laughs> the two of them were, were so refreshing and startling, I think, to the public. Uh, that the, there was this this image that, that lives on and lives on in, in more than a little bit uh, because of her because you know she's the one who came up with Camelot uh, she's the one who who told uh, Schlesinger right Teddy White, it was. Teddy White yeah that that the uh, this had been her husband's favorite song and uh, once that got into the national psyche. You sort of think, well, that must have happened at the time of the when they were in office, but it didn't at all. It was much later. She guarded his image and she kept it up, and uh, so there they are. Uh, I just did a story or, that'll be on in a couple of weeks about Jackie Kennedy, and I was amazed to learn that in the Smithsonian gift shop, there's only one first lady that has merchandise. Fifty years ago this all was, and people still come in there to buy Jackie Kennedy sunglasses and Jackie Kennedy earrings and replicas of things she had, and there's pictures of her wearing it, and then, the, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, a, it's amazing. It's just incredible. Where's your pink pill box? <laughs> <laughs> I should have worn that. You, you want to keep going and talk a little bit about the impact on the country, for example, through the ratings that the TV tour of the White House got. I'm sure at a certain age, anybody in this room of a certain age remembers that night. Well, it was the first time a lot of people had ever heard her speak. And you know, she had this breathy voice, this sort of very dramatic way of expressing herself. 56 million people watched that. <laughs> That's like one in four Americans at the time. I and mean, we can't get that many people to vote. You know, <laughs> so it, it was amazing. Um, I actually, I was a high school kid in California, a teenager, when 1960 happened, and I got swept up in it. Um, it was the first time I disagreed with my parents about politics. They were Adlai Stevenson liberals, and I got caught up in this and canvassed the entire year with my best friend in northern San Diego County. Um, and then later, as a writer, began to bump into all of this. And I think there's another element here, and that's the consequences for the country of what happened. It's, believe it or not, there actually was a substantive side to all of this. It was actually about something. And I still think it's terribly important that the United States is here today, largely because this guy happened to win the presidency. Um, that may still, be a, uh, one of the bolder statements made yes. from the stage. You want to explain we, that? We, yeah. Um, nobody had had a creative thought uh, when the age of nuclear weapons began. Nobody had thought outside the box about nuclear weapons from 1945 on uh, until uh, he and a bunch of his advisors confronted this vexing, maddening problem in Cuba in the fall of 1962. Came this close. It came even closer than we realized at the time. It's been like a voyage of discovery in the 50 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis to realize just how close uh, it came. And the idea that somebody could think, not just think outside the box, but act outside the box in a way that prevented what looked like it was almost certainly going to be a full-scale nuclear war is consequential. I think it's also very important that so much of what he thought of to run on, actually, in 1960 is still with us. My favorite example is Medicare, um, something that had been dormant for a half a generation in American politics, was revived in his head for 1960. We are still living with the consequences of that decision today, whether you like it or not. Uh, secondly, the idea that the government should provide assistance directly to American public school districts had never been broached at the national level before he did in 1960. 
we can have a discussion about how much he could have helped get en enacted before he was murdered. But um, the, the fact that so much of what he advanced and so much of what he did is still with us today is another hint at, at just how consequential his life was. But don't you think, too, though, that because we don't know what would have happened, you know, it, it's, a, it's a movie that was stopped in progress, and, and so you can't help but ask yourself, you know, what would have happened had he not been killed? Uh, and the drama itself of the assassination, I think, is, is half of what keeps the legend alive. I, I think that's right. Uh, you know, you brought up the uh, creative uh, initiatives that he proposed in Congress, but of course they were going nowhere. It's true, but to pick up on Susan's point, I think part of what we don't know, I mean, don't forget, it, what you're saying is absolutely true. There wasn't an aspect of his, of his uh, administration's recommendations that wasn't completely dead in the water uh, in Congress. At, at, I mean, there were a couple of exceptions, but basically true. On the other hand, we don't know um, how he would have been beating Barry Goldwater's rear end from one end of the country to the other, just as Lyndon Johnson ended up doing. Barry Goldwater would have been the same candidate. Um, and the benefits of a victory over Goldwater would have been apparent legislatively, politically, et cetera. So the speculation works both ways. Um, I just think that, I mean, I've never been a Camelot person. I, I don't like, it makes me uncomfortable, um, uh, glamour. <laughs> because I have none, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but things that matter to people linger with me. And this is, in many respects, um, uh, the, f the second post-New Deal presidency. Uh, and, and we are still living with the consequences today. As you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson got those things passed. <laughs> And Lyndon Johnson's style could not have been further from John Kennedy's style, which tends to make Jacqueline Kennedy's Camelot, there'll never be another time like this, more pronounced when Lyndon Johnson's style follows John Kennedy's style. Would John Kennedy be John Kennedy we know today if there had not been Lyndon Johnson? I sure. You, you can't even conceptualize John Kennedy without it was two years and ten months and he was killed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just, I find it very hard to, mm -hmm. to sort of parse all that because it's, that's just such an integral mm -hmm. aspect of evaluating him. Right. So, I don't know. The, um, Are you offended that I would link Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy? No, no. <laughs> It's, you know, it's fun. Johnson. John the, Kennedy the, might have been. The <laughs> link that's available now on these tape recordings um, that, God, that almost sounds, they're almost pornographic to me, <laughs> of him and Mrs. Kennedy talking in the weeks and months after the president was murdered and the seduction going on. Actually, sort of back and forth, right? Would you please explain? So that people I'm not can sure get where a, we're going here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you woke everybody but the link, up. Yeah. The link. The link. The link between. The link really occurred. There really was. No, when they I when mean, they released the the L, to LBJ tapes, there were some of <coughs> her. She had been, you know, she when Kennedy was killed, Mrs. Kennedy had no place to go. She had no home. Johnson let her stay in the White House as long as she needed to, wanted to. And um, he, had, he had sent her a note, and she, she, I believe she called him to thank him for the note. And if you listen to that tape, it's, it's very strange, because these two powerful people are obviously testing each other. Even, even it's 10 days after the assassination. And uh, she, you know, oh, Mr. President, Mr. President. <laughs> and he's, oh, my little girl, you know, mm -hmm. we're just going to take such good care of you. <laughs> and it, it's just bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, you've, I'm sure uh -huh. you've heard that. You know yeah. the one I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, and, and then he says something like, uh, oh, she's, she tells him that she has more notes in his handwriting than she has in Jack's. Mm 
And he, he says something about, what, you've been running around with two presidents. And she says, oh, me running around with two presidents, is that how people think of me? And it's just like, this is really strange. <laughs> yeah. But they're obviously, you know, it, it, you can't figure out who's, what they want from each other exactly. It, it may just be that this is how they were used to proceeding with people. Um, but I found listening to that very, t very telling. You should, yeah. Try it if you can find it. It's out there somewhere on YouTube. Well, and that continuity was everything to Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not deviating one millimeter from the course as it existed mm -hmm. on November 22nd, with one exception. I'm convinced Vietnam, um, where there was a change, a lurch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, well, we oh. discussed in class today uh, what Kennedy would have done if he had lived in Vietnam. We'll never know, but uh, the two of you have uh, studied him and how he came to achieve public policy. What do you think? Well, um, uh, my, my favorite source is Edward Kennedy, who absolutely harbored no doubt whatsoever. Um, and in fact, he got angry if you tried to introduce another point of view, which in, in deference to the facts, you can introduce another point of view. It's just Kennedy didn't accept it at all. And, and he always looked at it from the standpoint of would President Kennedy have ever ordered the bombing of the North? And would he have ever allowed anything approaching 50,000, much less 500,000 American soldiers to go there, uh, and the answer from the available evidence is that would never have happened. That's impossible. Um, and I think, I'm not aware of any significant evidence that supports a contention that Kennedy would have supported the escalation. Just the opposite, uh, Ken is Kennedy uh, had a well-known disdain for the generals and their predictions. He, he viewed their predictions uh, with lots of skepticism. He had had two mm -hmm. really shattering experiences with what I, yeah, Kennedy, I think, as the historical record continues to build, is, is one of these presidents who, among other things, is an example of, of how leaning on people for advice or information can be really dangerous in any setting. And the deference that one is sort of inclined to feel instinctively toward the military or toward military advice in foreign policy crises, it's all understandable. But the Bay of Pigs and the first shock waves of the Cuban Missile Crisis convinced uh, Kennedy that these guys are as capable of screwing up as, <laughs> as anybody else. And you always have to have an independent counterweight uh, to the advice of experts, mm -hmm. which is why God created White Houses <laughs> <laughs> on the eighth day. I Tom, think. you mentioned being caught up uh, in 1960 with John Kennedy, and clearly he created an idealism across the country that had not been there before. And that idealism, uh, Curtis and I were on a program last week uh, that asked the question, did idealism die with John Kennedy? And we went pretty quickly from idealism to cynicism. Mm -hmm. And so I'd ask uh, both of you, because you really uh, monitor and know political attitudes, uh, did idealism die with John Kennedy? And why did we move so quickly from idealistic highs to cynical lows? Manic, depressive, I think, <laughs> national yeah. character. Boy, that's a tough one. I, I just, I think the national shock was such that uh, it pretty much shattered, you know, it shattered people. I mean, I, I wasn't all that old when it happened, but I do remember it happening. And uh, there's, I don't, I've never had another experience like that. I mean, it's, it was just, it's, if you weren't there, it's sort of hard to imagine the mm -hmm. state of the country mm -hmm. um, for it not to have been, had long, have long lasting effects, I can't imagine. I mean, particularly because <clears throat> of the, the, perfection of these two people that, you know, uh, at least in, not in my household, my family was Republican, <laughs> they weren't so perfect to them. Um, but the image and the image that they had managed to create very carefully uh, 
Um, and I think people felt close to him. The, the man had something like a 64 press conferences, I think, some in, in less than three years. Right. He had one, like every two weeks, he would have a press conference. Mm -hmm. and, and so people, and people watched them. Um, so the fact that he was, he was killed in the way he was killed, uh, it couldn't help but scar the mm -hmm. national psyche. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one image of that pink dress, and mm -hmm. you know, you, you can kind of appreciate the horror of yeah. it. Just five years after it happened, though, when Curtis and I were babies, um, it happened again. Um, you know, twice. twice. Yeah. Yep. So, um, adding to the cynicism and yes. disbelief, and, 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 and what's you the know, point? And, and, and you had a government that was lying uh, uh, repeatedly about Vietnam. It was very hard not to become cynical once you realized that, you know, our leaders were lying, and then on top of that, you get Nixon <laughs> in and um, a, a neurotic. Uh, uh, at best, a liar, a crook, and uh, how do we not become cynical all in a decade from 63 to 73? Do you think it was reflected in our work? I've often wondered, you know, uh, uh, you'll remember when, when, when Edward Kennedy started out in 1980, those of us who were going to take you know, whether it was Carter or Reagan or, or those who were going to take that journey in 1980 because of Kennedy. I can remember there was a lot of talk around the planes. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to make the mistake that people made in the press 20 years before when John Kennedy ran. We're going to be, we're going to be tough, idealistic and all. Of course, Kennedy made it easier, easy for us because he screwed up so much. <laughs> all, all you had to do was have a tape recorder running. And he, so are you saying Ted Kennedy was held to a higher standard? Uh, no, he was held to standards. I mean, it was, a, it, was something, it was something that was talked about in our racket before it happened. Now, is it true that the look back shows a press corps that didn't do a job. On and, which? Uh, which? 1960. Um, in the case of 1960, I'm absolutely positive it didn't. <laughs> Where I have my doubts is 1968 and Bob Kennedy. No, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Uh, in terms 1960, of 1960. You, you, you have, if, if you do, what do they call it in the academic journalism departments today? Content analysis, is that the term? Um, I mean to learn what that is someday. But, but apparently, uh, people who have done like, you know, a, a month of New York Times coverage of 1960 or a, uh, a summer of the Los Angeles Times after the convention in Los Angeles, and you can't tell anything. Uh, political journalism in 1960 was a totally different animal than it is today. Um, people forget, some people here may remember, for one thing, there was so much more space in the papers. Um, at least a third to a half more than there is uh, now. They had eight column formats, the type was smaller, a story on a presidential campaign routinely ran 1,500, 2,000 words. There was nothing unusual about that. It was all about speeches. And it was what he said, <laughs> where he went, what he did, probably things you as consumers would very much like to know every <laughs> once in a while, you know, <laughs> from, the, from people like us. We began to rebel against it as people like Curtis and, my, and I were starting out in our our infancy because we thought we kept referred to set scenes, right, or reporters behaving as stenographers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I never thought we were uh, in that period, but it is true that it was a totally different profession that covered John Kennedy, but it was one that was primarily based on providing detail, <laughs> mm -hmm. not on b being in somebody's I, pocket. I think the Teddy White book on the 1960 uh, campaign changed the way political reporters approached their job. Right. It was a lot of 
inside baseball. Yeah. Uh, and, and you learned that it helps to cover something other than what the candidate's actually saying. Well, you also started to have a problem in that what the candidate was saying had been on television the night before. True. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Susan, the biggest, uh, the biggest media change uh, with John Kennedy was in television. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many more people started covering the president, and this was the first real TV president. Oh, and it really made the print reporters crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so what, Anything that makes print reporters crazy is a good thing. <laughs> so so oh, no. you're, far, you're far more aware than we are of what changes took place be, uh, with television coming of age as it relates to coverage then and now. Well, I mean, Kennedy just, you know, he came along at the perfect instant. Um, I can't remember, I looked this up and now I can't remember. There was something like when, when Eisenhower was elected, there were 20% of American households had television sets. Does that sound right? Okay. And Kennedy, when Kennedy was elected, 80% did. Um, and he does this, you know, live thing and the print reporters are all afraid that it's gonna, you know, destroy the presidency and maybe the country. Uh, it's, it's not intimate, it's, it's making their work irrelevant, they're being used as props, I mean, just great stuff, <laughs> mm -hmm. reading all about this. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, uh, television, you know, for so long, television was the poor stepchild of political coverage, and, and in the time that I've been at CBS, that has changed dramatically. Uh, initially, the only people anybody wanted to hire at the Pentagon or at the White House or whatever, were old print reporters. It wasn't considered, you know, there wasn't enough gravitas in your average television person to cover politics for a long time. It was very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that has, that has gradually just changed totally. I mean, now, obviously, we're in this system where, you know, there's right-wing TV and left-wing TV, which 25 years ago you couldn't even imagine. So it, it's transformed it totally. And, and people, unfortunately, gravitate toward whoever they agree with, um, which doesn't exactly help the conversation. So I'm, I don't know. I mean, it's places like this where you've got to figure out what to do about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Though the numbers still stun me from back then. I mean, again, when he became president, when he's the first television president, and the idea of having the every other week televised news conference pops up and they start in. What's the rating for the first one? Uh, 60, 65 million people. In the middle of the day. <laughs> 65 million people, right. Yeah, there's more than one in every four people. Somewhat more readers than Curtis yeah. and I ever. Yeah. Now that, that tapered off to like 18 as yeah. the time went on. There isn't a TV show out there that gets 18 million people, I don't think. Mm. Now. That's amazing. Not even uh -huh. then. It's, not, um, uh, it's important to recall uh, uh, Kennedy's approach here, which was revolutionary, was linked to his concept of the office. One reason there were so many things that happened, the televised press conference is obviously one example, having his wife be the public figure that she was is another. Um, maximizing it in every way you can because Kennedy had not a cynical but a very realistic view of the power of the office. He was heavily influenced going in by a budding scholar who later became an iconic figure in American scholarship, uh, Richard Neustadt at Harvard who had done the first really comprehensive study of presidential decision-making in American history in the years just before Kennedy was elected president called Presidential Power. And Kennedy had not only read the book, he had talked to Newstadt a great deal. And Newstadt's theory, borne out in his study of events, was that the presidency in the American system is a very weak office on paper and in reality particularly because of Congress uh, and in domestic affairs generally. It is true that the President of the United States can blow up the world and destroy all life on this planet. <laughs> we, we grant that as the sort of asterisk in all of that. But for all of that, the power of the office is actually very limited and that the only chance to maximize 
is to be an intense user of what Newstad liked to call the modern bully pulpit. And of course, that's, that was tough. So Kennedy, Kennedy wasn't doing this for, he was doing it for governing purposes. That it, it, he thought that being visible was the only route to acquiring the kind of political power uh, that might enable some of his initiatives to make it into law. But he also came from a family where image was certainly appreciated. Absolutely. You know, Joe Kennedy had been in Hollywood. Uh, these people, you know, understood the value of good publicity, certainly. And, and if he wouldn't and, have kept doing them every other week, if this hadn't. And knew how to manipulate the system exactly. to get it. I mean, I, I, there are stories we could tell. Um, <laughs> I mean, they really did do this. <laughs> my, one of my favorites, uh, uh, you know, uh, they could often did reach into the national media and influence coverage directly. One of my favorites, uh, you all know Parade Magazine, that thing they stick in the Sunday papers sometimes? <clears throat> it used to be much bigger than it is now, like everything having to do with print. And um, uh, in the, I can't remember whether it was in the front or the back of Parade, there was Walter Scott's front. personality, Parade, remember that? Yeah. Front, sure. Um, it, it was a pen name. The, the thing was actually written by a guy named Lloyd Shearer. Uh, uh, who, uh, and, but it was the closest thing in those days newspapers got to running gossip, uh, serious newspapers, anyway. And I remember two items. One of them disclosed the affair that Joe Kennedy had with Gloria Swanson. Um, and there was a call into several papers that carried parade um, before that Sunday. And they all were completely missing parade on the Sunday in question. This is like 1967, 68. It's fairly, fairly late in the game. And there aren't very many sources of power in America that can pull something like that off. There was another one that's actually funny. <laughs> um, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's sister. Lee? Yeah, who, who was married to some Polish guy who had a title. A prince, and so she was always called Red, Prince Radziwill. Princess, Princess Radziwill. Lee Radziwill, okay? And she, the, the prince's name, I think, was Stanislaus or something. They called him Stash in the, <laughs> in the White House. And this was apparently, uh, like many marriages, I guess, in the 1950s, not altogether based on passion and love and mutual understanding and <laughs> things some of us think have to do with marriages. It was more of an arrangement. Um, and um, he fooled around in his own way, and she did too. And so the item that was in parade in draft form early on the week in question in the mid-60s, Scott wrote a, Lloyd Shearer wrote it so that it said, uh, she, he doesn't object to Lee's boyfriends, and she doesn't object to his. <laughs> Oops. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that copy of Parade was yeah. missing <laughs> that Sunday. Well, um, and you know, if it makes anybody uncomfortable, it should. That's, that's you know, there's a seamy side to this. Um, though, um, uh, as the years passed, the, the, the surviving Kennedys, Edward Kennedy used to laugh out loud at some of the excesses of his brothers and his fathers. Mm -hmm. By the standards he had to live by, that kind of conduct was, was not possible. But this wasn't just a question of glamour. This was a question of uh, conscious manipulation, care and feeding. I know a lot of you have questions and uh, want to ask. Uh, we'll go to the audience, and uh, who will go first? Yes. Yes. Uh, 
think there was a different ethos. I, I think the, the uh, I mean, the White House reporters, as nearly as I can understand it, knew what was going on. Um, Bob Pierpoint was quoted, he was the CBS White House reporter, and he said, and he's, he's died now, but he said that he knew. He, I mean, they all were aware of these things. They didn't pursue it. And his quote was, I'm not a gossip columnist. You know, they didn't feel like that was appropriate. Um, I don't know how much of it was direct intimidation by the White House. I think some of it, though, was just their own interpretation of what their job was. And that was considered, uh, you know, off limits. So they didn't. And it does seem incredible. You Charles, know? what did Sandy Van Oker say when uh, I wasn't at class that day, but we he, he said Sandy Van Oker, who covered the Kennedy White House for NBC. NBC. <clears throat> he said they didn't know. And he, he said, said they didn't know. That's what he said. Pierpoint and, said he did, or he and, claimed that he did. And he also said, but if they had known, mm -hmm. that their bosses wouldn't have run the story. You know, it does yeah. help to be guided by a standard in, in all this. And the one thing I will say for our ancestors in our racket is they did have standards. Um, when, when we were babies starting up in the mid-60s, um, the basic rule of thumb was that you didn't put something in the paper or on the air unless the behavior was directly impacting on someone's public responsibilities. And that's a were, pretty hard, that's a pretty fine line to be able to draw. It is, or <laughs> if it found its way onto a police blotter. Okay, right, where, but you start getting into character questions that well, you can't say directly that this person's behavior is, you it, know, it A affects B, but still. It, it's a fair point, and it usually manifests itself in public drunkenness. Uh, but it did happen. Uh, I mean, the the scandal monger on the on the uh, respectable side of the press in those days was a guy named Drew Pearson. We all remember. Uh, many of us remember because uh, his young assistant went on to have quite a career himself, Jack Anderson. Um, but that was that was basically the idea. And there would every once in a while be. Uh, a story in one of Drew Pearson's columns that somebody was absolutely whatevered out of his mind uh, on the floor of Congress or in a committee meeting. He spent years going after one of the most powerful uh, members of the House Armed Fer Services Committee, Mendel Rivers of South Carolina. Uh, a police blotter incident in 1974 brought Wilbur Mills to all of our attention. Uh, it was a police blotter. Uh, you know, there were a lot of sad cases of drunks in Congress who were actually closeted gay people. And one guy in particular burst out of the closet one night uh, in a park in Washington by the Potomac River, drunk as a skunk, and um, uh, Bob Bauman, right? Um, and, um, uh, and that that got you in the paper or on the air in Wilbur Mills's case, and that was a standard. Nowadays, I don't understand what's motivating people or what what gets what gets you on the air or in the papers. One reason that I think we've taken such a hit in the credibility department over the last twenty years is that standards have sort of fallen apart in the press. I mean, it's okay to write about rumors today. I know guys in the newsroom who would have hit me if I'd attributed in something to a rumor forty years ago. Um, but at least there were standards, and Bob Pierpoint was those were standards was hardly unique. Oh. And I don't know why Sandy, I, well, anyway, um, both on the campaign trail and in the White House, there were several people who had a pretty clear idea what was going on. And I don't know of anybody I've talked to down through the years whose bosses or they themselves didn't say it had no business in the paper because it had nothing to do with what kind of uh, president or politician he was. Um, I've seen that influence uh, uh, coverage of other public, many other public figures in my time, especially in the Bush family. 
But we now evaluate politicians on character as much as we evaluate them on is policy. Right? But is yes. character just a euphemism for an excuse to look under the bed? Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> it, maybe it's a byproduct of television that makes people feel like they know somebody. Um, but it, it's hard to say it's irrelevant. Caitlin? Well, it's kind of related to what you're saying, but I think that oftentimes the Camelot years and this idea of what Kennedy was and this idea of what the Kennedy family administration was oftentimes overshadows policy. And so in your opinion, what do you think the takeaway from the Kennedy years was as far as policy goes? Because we've talked a lot about character in some cases lack thereof, depending on what your opinion is. Yeah. You know, we're right at that moment. Caroline Kennedy has a wonderful way of analyzing it now. Um, she says that this is right the moment we're living through now when all of this is passing into history. Um, uh, many of the figures who, who, who were there in an intimate sense, both senses of that word, um, have died, or uh, basically have died. Um, and so history is right now in the process of taking over. Um, it wasn't a presidency. It was a thousand days. Um, he's not the only person who died in office. He's also not the only person who was murdered in office. Um, but his time on the national scene came at a pivotal moment. It was mid-century, in effect. It was um, the Cold War. And it was the Cold War. Um, and so the setting mattered. Um, what I was trying to say earlier was one of the reasons it's endured is because the consequences of it have mattered so much. I mean, I, I could go on. It was the first time we looked, we not only the first time we looked nuclear war in the eyes and didn't do it, but learned from it. And the first steps away from this madness began in that period. Um, we never got a chance to, to see somebody resist the, the urge to, to escalate the fighting in Vietnam, but I'm positive we would have. Um, Medicare is an interesting thought because it's, it's not what you ordinarily think about when you think of John Kennedy or revolutionizing the approach to elementary and secondary education in the United States is not something you generally associate with President Kennedy, but it's, but it's there. How am I doing? You are right. <laughs> uh, a hand, yes, uh, back here and then we'll go here. Yes, Sean. Only about three months into his presidency, yeah. Scott. It's a lot harder. But I take Scott's uh, yeah, you're, I, I take Scott's well comment taken. and yeah. say that Reagan's uh, image and general popularity beyond the people who elected him went up after he was shot. Mm, sure. Yeah. Even George Wallace's popularity yeah. went up after <laughs> right. he got shot. <laughs> Or, or right, or Kennedy's went up after the Bay of Pigs, which I still <laughs> mystifies me. <laughs> yes. You mentioned the glamour of the Kennedy years and the time of his election. But unlike you young people, I was a voting age at that time. And my recollection is this indelible notion that it was a generational change. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think you're right. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. And I think the, you know, the contrast with the Eisenhowers, just the, the visual image of the Kennedys added to that. And, and he played on it and uh, appreciated how useful that could be. And you know, it's uh, th that's absolutely the case. It, w it was substantive. It wasn't just you know a slogan. I mean, uh, they were they were fresh and new and ready. His his biggest problem was convincing people that he was ready to do it. You know that he was experienced enough to take the job on. Right. 
that makes me return to Scott's, Scott, right? Yeah. Your, your point that, I mean, we all remember the f new faces, the fresh faces, the enthusiasm that accomp accompanied two real uh, conservative watershed events. One was Reagan's election. To an extent, it was also Goldwater's nomination. But really, Reagan's election. And then the triumph in the midterms in 1994 uh, that Newt Gingrich engineered. Um, uh, I, you know, there were, there were score, uh, score, hundreds, thousands of people suddenly around Washington who hadn't been before with a real sense of mission who felt that conservatism had sort of come in from the cold and that it wasn't something, um, you know, upstairs in the attic like Uncle Elmer or, or something, but that it was, it was part of the go gonna be part of the governing fabric uh, of the country. And it's been a rough ride the, these last 30 years and there's a lot of disappointment associated with what hasn't happened. But, um, but what, what happened around President Kennedy wasn't unique and it's happened before. I, I, the New Deal beginning is another example. My, my great uncle went there in his early 30s as general counsel of the Treasury Department. And you know there were thousands of these uh, young people drawn to try to save the country at a, at a critical moment. This is one of the reasons I think that 2016 is going to be so interesting. Because yeah. you, could, you could have a generational uh, face-off I guess in the Democratic Party, I don't know. You could, <laughs> you, know, you could, right? Uh, or the Republican you, could be the young guy. Oh, absolutely, and, and, and yeah. If, if Hillary Clinton decides to do it, and she'll be 68 years old when she runs, I think, if she does, um, and you try to figure out, well, who are the Republicans going to end up with? And you know, none of them is anywhere near that old. I mean, they're much, much younger than that. Reminds so, me of the line. Remember when John Lindsay uh, finally stopped being mayor of New York City in the mid-70s, he was replaced by, <laughs> uh, remember, <laughs> a beam, <laughs> <That's old. right. laughs> who was a little guy, quite elderly. He was I think he was past 70 at the time he was elected uh, mayor after this 1960s, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Cool and guy. the first <laughs> transition meeting, Lindsay uh, had a guy working for him named Dick Aurelio, who we all knew in politics. And the A-B people come in getting ready to take over, and he turns and he says, well, the torch is passing to a new generation. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You, know, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, uh, Lindsay, who was a Republican, uh, later became a Democrat. But uh, there was you know, not only was it passed to a new generation with Kennedy, but there were so many people who emulated Kennedy. Oh, yeah. uh, you, you had a generation of <laughs> kind of <laughs> want to be Kennedy. Still do. Stick uh, your hand in the coat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it changed American politics. You know the style of of, of the Kennedys. And John you know, John Lindsay being one of them. You know, the slinging the coat over his shoulder. And uh, uh, the, and in uh, in Boston we had Kevin White and. Uh, the loner in love with the city and That's all it. this stuff. And, and, and then one of Kennedy, you know, so many lines got stolen. But the one, the backhanded compliment that still impresses me the most, you know, just before he went down to Washington to take office, um, uh, Kennedy did a farewell speech uh, at the state legislature um, in, in Boston a place he'd avoided like the plague for all of his adult life. But um, while, while he was there, he, he talked about the importance of New England and Massachusetts as an influence on the forming mind of a, of a national politician. And he went back to John Winthrop's time in the 17th century when the Sermon on the Mounts um, uh, invocation of a shining city on a hill was was uh, was was used, 
and famously put it in his speech. And God, Reagan sometimes would take a hot stove rhetorically. <laughs> and now everybody uses that line. Everybody thinks it's Reagan's line. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> now. <Yeah. laughs> That'll change. Yes, in the back. Do you want to go first, Curtis? Good to hear it. The, the lasting impact. Is, lasting lasting impact, impact or the legacy, uh, substantive legacy of John F. Kennedy. Well, I think you could you could see it with what Lyndon Johnson accomplished with great society. I think you know so much of the momentum started uh, with with JFK, and, and then uh, LBJ took it over. And that's certainly lasting uh, far more than I any legislation you can attribute to uh, to uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, also, uh, volunteerism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which he, he basically enunciated in his inaugural address, and led to the Peace Corps and things like uh, Vista. And you know, today you could would, you could probably say that Teach for America is kind of a stepchild anyway of, of, uh, of the Kennedy administration. I would say that uh, the lasting legacy of John Kennedy, particularly as it relates to the South, is that under John Kennedy's leadership, the Civil War finally ended. Uh, John Kennedy was the first president to come out four square against segregation and the first president to introduce sweeping civil rights legislation. And then uh, next, and equally important, the first president to uh, achieve a limited test, uh, ban, nuclear test ban treaty. And because of that leadership, we now have no nuclear tests uh, above ground or in outer space or underwater. Uh, we still have uh, underground uh, tests that go on different places. But that, uh, in terms of the overarching uh, uh, outlook in terms of where we are as a world may have been his most important accomplishment. Yeah, the only thing I would add would be the, the notion that we did get that close to nuclear war and it didn't happen. So that's, a, if you're looking for a concrete contribution, that, that would seem to me to be one that you don't have to speculate about what would have happened later. We know what happened then. Yeah. And that, that managed to turn out okay. So. Well, we want to thank uh, the very smart Tom Oliphant and Susan Spencer, and we appreciate you coming to be with us today. <laughs>